Well, I should thank you for your patience and sticking around for the last presentation. It's been a long session. Um, I do want to acknowledge my collaborators here. And uh, most of the work that I show here was done when I was at Washington State University. And my PhD student, I believe, is in the room. Hey there. Yeah, so raise your hand. He's done much, hand up, hey there, be proud of the work that you, he's done much of the grunt work and the analysis that you see on the screen. And then uh, my collabor other collaborator at Washington State University, Professor Michael Walcott, and the work was done in collaboration with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And the funding organization was RPAE. So the focus is gonna be um, on the very last few words of the title, which is chitin nanofibers and nanocrystals, I'm going to show how they enhance mechanical properties and whether we can piggyback right on that to reduce potentially cement content in concrete. So if you've not heard of chitin, which I won't be surprised if you haven't, is anyone familiar? Has anyone heard of chitin? Raise of hand. Just a few, <laughs> it's good. As <laughs> the few hands go up, but it's actually a very important polysaccharide in nature. It's the second most abundant biopolymer produced after cellulose. Um, and so it has a very similar molecular structure as cellulose, um, except it has um, um, acid emet groups on C2 positions. So you can see the structure over here. Um, some hundred billions of it is produced in a variety of species in animals and plants. Um, primarily crustaceans, um, in some fungi, yeast, insects, and other animals that you can see in the, in the photos. Um, but we can't necessarily go and chase, you know, but though you can grow them, insects and mushroom, that's not what we did. What we used as a source for chitin was seafood waste. Um, so the bark from seafood industry constitutes to about six to eight million tons a year globally. In the United States, the numbers are not that, you know, accurately available, but I found a resource that said about 200,000 tons of shrimps. It's consumed about 35,000 lobsters, and this is setting us up for lunch. <laughs> and 90,000 tons of crabs are processed in the U.S. annually. And so as you can see in the picture is that as they pick the meat, the rest of it, the bark, is typically either composted or landfilled or has to be treated, which is not cheap, before it can be discarded or thrown back in the ocean. So um, this though it seems to be a waste, it does have good chemical value to it, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, so as you can see down there, the shells, the waste shell of a crab or lobster or shrimp is a combo of calcium carbonate, chitin, and protein. And so it together, the calcium carbonate and the chitin components together provide this strong reinforced shell for the habitat. Um, and, and that was the inspiration for our study, is that, hey, that's what we do. We make concrete structures, we make habitats, and if chitin working that well for the crab, for the habitat inside, we can also take advantage of that. So there are nano chitin, nanofiber chitins that are wrapped around with protein layers, and that's what we're tapping into, and we're extracting those chitin nanofibers and using them as an admixture in concrete. So the way to extract these could go two routes. It could be a chemical route, which uses is a tempo mediated oxidation and so you use the tempo solution this was in itself a mini trial study to find out what concentration of tempo to use and what duration of oxidation and that impacts the properties of the nanomaterial that is generated you can see in the picture the suspension has about 1% solid chitin materials in it and you can see the surface properties. I will I will talk about the surface groups in a minute in more details. The second way of producing these is by a complete mechanical process. So um, our group set up a super mass collider and this has shearing grinding disks to it. And then again, we had to perform a trial experimentation now, what should be the spacing between the grinding disks and what should be the duration of grinding. But essentially what it does is that by shearing and mechanical force, it removes all the amorphous portion of chitin and only releases and renders the crystalline nanofiber region region of the material. And so the solution, is, as you can see, is more gel-like, is more viscous. This is a different nature to it a little bit in terms of viscosity to the nanocrystals um, and comes with different surface groups. 
So um, just to differentiate again, we got on the left hand side chitin nanocrystals that were produced by tempo oxidation and on the right hand side we have chitin nanofibers that were produced by a mechanical <coughs> process. They are different in morphology um, and if you were familiar with the literature on cellulose nanocrystals and cellulose nanofibers, these are very similar um, to those materials. So um, the nanocrystals um, more so getting ready for lunch look like orzo to me and so there are these individual rods and in diameter they're around eight eight point seven nanometer um and then in length they're they're longer 200 gives giving a big aspect ratio but if we look at the nanofibers um they're width under 20 nanometer but their length they actually chain up so they result in really long um a thousand nanometer in the micron range length so they become quite lengthy so we characterized these extensively. We looked at their um, zeta potential. We were interested in uh, what surface charges they come with because of the in potential interaction with um, clinker particles in the cement. So first we measured their zeta potential in DI water and um, CHNF came out positive, slightly positive in CHNC, a large negative charge. Then we measured, we created a simulated cement pore solution and re-measured um, the zeta potential and they do both come out with a relatively large negative surface charges to them. Um, we also looked at their XRD pattern. We were basically interested to see what is their crystallinity index, and that's why you can see using those peaks, we calculate the crystallinity index, which comes out to be 92%, which is really high, meaning that most of the amorphous region was removed and we're left with this highly crystalline nanofiber, nanocrystalline material. Uh, a little bit further characterization, we're really interested in surface groups. It was mentioned in previous uh, presentations too that that functionality on the surfaces are really important for inter, um, interactions with the cement particles. Looking at um, the carboxylic group region, uh, we noticed that the nanocrystals have a little higher peaks than the nanofibers. Um, and that is expected from tempo oxidation. It's basically changing um, OH groups to COOH group. So that was expected. Over here in that region, we see some ammonia groups, which expected for chitin, and then we see some OH groups, but more so for NC, and we think that's because of its higher surface area over nanofiber. We also um, did titration with, I believe, um, sodium hydroxide and measure the amount of carboxylic groups um, for each of them. As you can see, the nanofiber one from mechanical process does not come with much carboxylic groups, but the CHNNC does come with carboxylic group. So this is exciting because they already come from their extraction method. They already come with functions on the surface groups and they're highly reactive um, when we introduce them in the cement system. So on that note, before introducing them um, to cement paste or mortar, um, we looked at how to disperse this material. Ultrasonication is, is one of the methods that I'm presenting on. We did also look at high shear mixer. And so we did a little trial and tried out a two minute sonication, a 10 minute and a 30 minute sonication, um, just to see, well, how long should we sonicate this stuff? And so then we exposed uh, the suspension after sonication to UBI spectroscopy to see how much light trans transmittance we see as an indicator of how effective sonication is. So you can see in the top graph uh, with the CHNC, sonication is not, does not have that much of a significance of an impact on, um, although you do see a trend with more transmittance with more um, duration of sonication, but it's more effective with CHNF, the ones with the really long chains. So what we were worried about though is that though it seems like we do get a more transmittance uh, with 30 minutes of sonication, we didn't want to physically degrade or change the properties of the CHNF. And so we looked at uh, images, um, TEM images of, of the CHNF after 30 minutes, the diameter did reduce. So we, did, we decided to go halfway. We went with a 10 minute sonication. Um, for dispersion. So everything was sonicated 10 minutes long and then introduced to the cement paste, which I'm not presenting here. That's a separate study. It's published already and you can read on it. Thus, in this presentation, we're going to look at the results in the mortar. So up top, you can see the mortar uh, mix design, mass ratios, 
And then for CHNC, we tried out all of those dosages. It was it did come up in one of the presentations that using nanomaterials, you just need a really, really tiny fraction of this material. So those dosages are 0.02% of the total cement in the mixer. So in the mixture, in the same dosages for both CHNC and CHNF. Then we tried out a mixture with combined with super plasticizer with each one of those materials to see if better dispersion with a polycarboxylate type super plasticizer would have a good impact on mechanical properties. And then we also, at the very end, you see we did a hybrid com combination of the uh, nanocrystal and the nanofiber because they're both negatively charged to see if they can interact well, disperse each other, and um, have a synergistic impact. So it starts off with some of the fresh properties and not showing very scientific <laughs> test results here. It's basically a flow table and a, a penetration test for setting time. We did look at rheology in the cement paste. It's a different study. It's available in the paper. But for today, I'm just showing the results of the flow table. You're going to see a series of bar graphs, and they all come in the same arrangement. So the first cluster shows the impact of introducing the nanocrystals to the control, which is a plain mortar. The second cluster in the middle shows the impact of nanofibers to the mortar. And then the last cluster is the one with the super plasticizer and the hybrid of the two types of nanofibers. So in general, just looking at the graph, um, you can see there is a declining trend, but not too much. Um, CHNC did impose um, up to 26%, but that is, is a really high ratio at a really high dosage. Um, we got that much uh, reduction in workability, but overall they're all hovering around that 110 um, from the ASTM. CHNF, not much um, really reduction in workability, a little bit at higher dosages, which are expected. Really, you go high in dosages past their percolation limit and they start to agglomerate anyways. And then super plasticizer um, improves workability, then you introduce the nanomaterials and they go down a little bit in workability. Then in terms of final setting time, um, here are the results in, um, in the first slide, we'll look at the impact of CHNC and the horizontal lines on the graph are the impact of super plasticizer. So the control here is the one zero, the one the mix with the zero nanomaterials. So this, and the blue, the blue color is initial set and orange color is final set time. And so we can see at the optimal dose of um, 0 0.05, the CHNC increase the delayed the setting time um, almost as much as a super plasticizer and then in the final set time um, more than a super plasticizer but 30 minutes um, and so this is this was brought up with the carbon nanofibers also that it gives you more time more workability to place it um, finish it so you could use it as a set regulating admixture um, same thing with the nanofibers. Um, they're effective at um, increasing final set time, initial set time, buying you more time to place um, and work with the concrete, though at a different dosage. So they're dosage sensitive. Um, and that makes sense because their morphology is different. So just some graphical um, presentation of a hypothesis as to why um, they're delaying the setting time. We think that it's primarily related to their large <coughs> negative charge in the pore solution. Um, they tend to absorb to the positively charged clinker particles and by that disperse them. Um, the nanofibers uh, with their long chains, maybe they actually bridged the particles together and maybe by that mechanism um, they had a more delaying effect. Uh, but again, I just make hypotheses. We've not um, we've not really delved into what are the actual mechanisms of their impact on setting time. So, looking at some of the mechanical properties, um, we looked at uh, first uh, six beams. So, three beams tested on seven day and twenty eight day. Um, these are small beams and deflection measured at mid span with an LVDT. Then we used the broken pieces of the beams in compression. So first, um, here are the results of compressive strength. And this, this graph is um, super simplified. So it basically shows the ratio of uh, compressive strength to the control. It doesn't have the arrow bars in it. I just simplified it because all I want to show and talk about here is that look at the line at 1. And basically, what we see, everything is just hovering around that 1. Not going that much up, not going that much down. So they didn't adversely impact compressive strength. They didn't improve it that significantly either, although there are a couple of mixes that um, 
stick up the line on seven day, those are the ones with super plasticizer. So potentially coming from the super plasticizer impact. The one that um, primarily shows the impact of these nanomaterials is the flexural strength. So um, with this graph, we have the actual values of flexural strength. And so with first looking at the CHNC, we see on seven day a maximum of 15% um, improvement um, at 0 0.035 um, dosage. And then on 28 day, it's only seven to 9% improvement. But when we look at CHNF, we see um, a lot more 20% improvement in 28 day. We see that almost the bell curve shape uh, formed, pointing to an optimal doses of, dosage of around um, 0.05. And then when we look at the hybrid of the two, they did work quite well. They resulted in about 17% improvement. So the two of them mixed together did have a good synergy. Uh, we calculated the area under the load deflection graph to get an idea of their impact on fracture toughness. And uh, with that, you can see that example curve up top, CHNF did push the peak, um, further delayed that peak, that failure, and then pushed the peak strength up um, as well. And so you can see the impact of CHNF on fracture energy as quite significant. How much time do I have? Three, four minutes? OK. So the few next to slides is really analytically we delved into, so what are some of the ways that these nanomaterials are interacting with the cementitious materials? This one is really interesting. We were still non-believers after seeing the flexural strength results. We were like, well, let's go take samples of that bottom portion of the beam and then go see if there is any organic carbon in there um, to tell us whether the nanokite material actually there. And so this is the results is that these are quite a few samples and these are the mean values. So in the control, there is almost none organic carbon and it progressively goes up with CHNC and orders of magnitude higher with CHNF. So chitin did make it to the bottom portion of the beam um, and corroborates with the improvements that we see in the flexural strength. Um, at the mixer last night, a lot of people will, la will ask me, well, how do these work? And um, we just have guesses and hypotheses that potentially they're bridging some of the nano spaces between the hydrate particles. In fact, Haydar was able to find them. Um, he took a lot of images, and um, here he has found a, a cluster of them that uh, bridging across a nano space. And then there is a series of other analytical, I'll skip the results of FTIR. It was pointed out that it's pretty qualitative, which I also agreed. Um, but I do want to show the results of our um, nuclear magnetic resonance um, study. We wanted to see basically if these were able to have an impact of the, on the chain of silica tetrahedra. Uh, we looked at polymerization degree, which is the ratio of Q2 position over to Q1, and then also degree of hydration. Uh, based on NMR. Um, we ran the NMR on both seven day age sample and 28 day age sample. The first graph shows the PD that on 28 days, especially the CHNF did really improve in polymerization. That was really exciting to see. And the degree of hydration did also progressively improve with both and both NC and NF. My last slide is, um, I saw this graph. It was a, in an FAA document. Um, which I failed to find uh, when I was submitting these uh, slides, but credit goes, goes to Charlie Greer. He developed the, he wrote the document. It's a really cool graph. It shows the flexural strength versus cement content in terms of sacks per cubic yard of concrete. So we got flexural strength versus sacks in a cubic yard of concrete. And so it says if your flexural strength goes up from 650 to 700, you can cut down half a sack of cement in your cubic yard. And if you go from 650 to 700, you can cut it another half a sack. So if we got from previous slides 25% improvement in flexural strength, and this is particularly important for pavements because we designed the pavement for flexural strength. Is it possible to cut down a full sack or more than a full sack of cement from a cubic yard? We're not quite there to give that answer. We need more testing in concrete and optimization in concrete, but this is the promise that makes me think there is room for more testing with these materials, and this is the vision for the future. And once we cut that one sack of cement, we could replace it with solid carbon for sequestration, or we could use less reactive um, pozzolanic materials. 
So in conclusions, um, they showed quite a bit of promise. I'm going to summarize it. I know everyone wants to run. <laughs> it's been a long session. So they showed quite a bit of promise in improving flexural strength in mortar and um, in fracture energy based on flexural strength testing. Um, our hypothesis is that they're bridging across nano spaces, but those are the portions that need more investigation. What are the mechanisms, functioning mechanisms that um, they're working in the cementitious pace? They do uh, change the rheology of the cement pace. They did change the flow of the mortar slightly. They could be used as a set regu regulating admixture. And overall, quite a bit of promise. Work continues. We're working on looking at scaling up to concrete, also looking at impact on microstructure durability, mainly in terms of drying shrinkage. So. Thank you very much.